All right. Good day, everyone. My name is Brock Galvin, and I'm your guest host today. Welcome to the show. And we got a really exciting guest today uh, out in Davis, California. We are on location at UC Davis, which is about an hour away from E-Team Sponsor Headquarters and about 20 minutes from our capital in Sacramento. Um, and I just want to preface this show with this understanding. There's going to be a lot of Aggie pride uh, today because we are we are here with Coach We're Hawkins. Aggies. We're both Aggies. We're both Aggies. So Coach Hawkins uh, probably needs no introduction, but just for those of you who don't know, he hails from Bieber, California, which is population 300. Was that what it was when you were there? Uh, it was a little, high, a little higher than that. A little I was higher. probably at 500. It was probably about 300 now. Okay. So pretty small town, but played JC football at Siskiyou's, right? College of Siskiyou's, College the of big Siskiyou's. town of weed. Yep. yep. And then came here to UC Davis, played fullback with Kenny O'Brien, right? Yeah. Was Kenny O'Brien well, here? Yeah, he was the guy. I was kind of the, just the background noise. <laughs> Number 34, uh, when he took the the head coaching gig here a couple years ago, he wore his Letterman, which is a pretty awesome – got to look up the, the video from it. It's pretty sweet. Um, and then started his coaching career here uh, as an assistant, went to Christian Brothers up in Sacramento, was a junior college coach, was a four-year college D.C., and then head coaching stops at Willamette, Boise State, Colorado, the CFL, Montreal, uh, internationally with USA Football, and was it? Uh, what was it? Uh, it was. I was in Karlstad in Sweden, and I was in okay. Vienna, Vienna, yeah, Austria, which so. is just crazy. So yeah. I've coached football, I think, now in fourteen countries, which is Golly, crazy. Holy man, Wild. that is nuts. So yeah, two-time WAC Coach of the Year, um, 2018 Conference uh, Coach of the Year, and then. Also, a huge honor that you just received last week, the, the 2018 Eddie Robinson Award recipient, which goes to the top coach uh, in the country at the Division One FCS level. So first off, congrats, um, and welcome you. to the show. Thank you. Yeah, good to be on. <laughs> so we tried to hook up at the AFCA, which is in San Antonio. A lot of our listeners are too coaches. Too crazy. Too crazy. Way too, too crazy. wild. Yeah, so I know you had a lot going on, but how, how was the conference for you? I'm, I'm great, Brock. I, I, I like one-on-one -on -one dialogue. I'm not a great work the room guy mm -hmm. it's a little mm -hmm. too surfacey for me mm -hmm. so i always feel it's i just disheveled i can't have the quality discussions with the people that i want to have and yeah. everybody's trying to connect and i get it um i what i did is i pulled people away from the convention and said hey let's yep. meet at this restaurant sure. and have breakfast here or have lunch there or have dinner there and uh it's great all those people go, but as you saw, I mean, there's I don't know I don't know how many came this year, maybe ten thousand. I don't know yeah, a lot of people. It was crazy, and and I know that even for for our team, when we saw like recognizable coaches like yourself, it was like for them to go ten yards was like fifteen conversations. Which... I always feel bad because you'll get in the lobby and someone go, "Hey, can I get five minutes?" And hey, everybody's worth something, right? Yeah. But you're also you're trying to get someplace. Yeah. Sometimes you got to tell a guy, "Hey, look." If every guy gets five minutes, how long is it going to take me to get from here to that door? Yes. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> so you always feel – I feel yeah. bad about that. I really don't like it. But sometimes yeah. you just go, hey, man, I appreciate it. Here's my card or whatever. Give me a call. Come by. Yeah. I got to roll. Yeah. Well, I'm glad this worked out. Um, just just to, I guess, for the audience, we met – I don't know if you remember – at yeah, the, the California – uh, state championships. They were hosting them at Sac State, and our our company is one of the sponsors for that event. But I was there just as a fan. Yeah, I was there to to watch the games. I was coaching at at Concord High School, which is a school down in the East yep. Bay at the time, um, and I was feeling bold. I was feeling confident. When I saw the UC Davis guys come in. I'm like, okay, I played there. I can go introduce myself. That's so great. Went up, introduced myself, and and had a good conversation. I was. I was struck by like your your ability to be so personable with like someone you had never <laughs> met, and I remember you gave me your number and um, flash forward to like the week of signing day, and the a player that I was coaching at Concord High had been recruited by a lot of schools and had a lot of offers, and basically the eleventh hour came and he still really wanted to go to Davis, and I texted y'all late at night yeah. and said, hey, he wants to go to Davis. And you need to check him out. And I remember you said, it's never too late. I'm sending this film to my staff right now. So I guess to preface the question, I mean, you're a head coach of a Division One program. You work for ESPN. People know you well. How do you balance your time when people, you know, want you to be available? And how do you, like, how do you find that balance? Well, I think you also realize after a while in life, I mean, I, 
my goal is always to make a positive difference in the lives of others. And you realize that, and, and I said this at the Eddie Robinson, you, you sort of become a vessel mm -hmm. for all these people that have invested in you, parents, coaches, teachers, uh, fellow coaches. And so you sort of owe it to pay it forward. And I get that whole realm. Um, I'm never too busy for anybody mm -hmm. on some level, uh, as long as it's meaningful, but uh, yeah, you, you try to include everybody to the degree that you can. If you can't, you can't. Yeah. Um, and somehow you just have to, sometimes you have to tell people no, yeah. and I've got to move on. But hey, we were, we've all been there, right? We've all been trying to ask questions or trying to meet people or trying to figure things out. And as you said, I came from a town of really small, great people, phenomenal people. My parents were great. All my people were great. But I mean, a lot of these things that I'm doing now, none of those people could give me any advice about. So how yeah. do I go find out yeah. about that? You need to ask people. You need to meet people. And, hmm. and I've had a lot of people help me along the way. And I always love, particularly in football, people say, oh, this guy invented that, that guy invented that. Nobody really invents it. He stole mm -hmm. it from somebody mm -hmm. else. Yeah. And so that's the whole idea is just to iron sharpens iron. And I get that, and I try to be as helpful as I can most of the time. I'm sure sometimes people think, hey, that guy was rude, but... Unfortunately, I probably had to meet somebody else yeah. and didn't want to be late. Yeah, you got to do the best you can. Um, one of the other things I remember from that conversation we had when I came with DeAndre, who's the player, uh, to his like recruiting weekend was you saying what, what kind of like moved the needle for you in terms of the conversation was I, I said in my text, like from one Aggie to another, this guy's an Aggie. Um, what makes someone an Aggie? And can you talk a bit about, for those who don't know what Aggie pride is, obviously I know it, obviously you know it. What, what is Aggie pride for folks who don't know? Well, one of our players I thought this year was great. He said, hey, it's, it's not a saying, it's not a song, it's a way of life, and it's not a snooty thing at all. Um, someone actually, in a sort of the same context, said, uh, was talking, we were talking about an SC guy, and they go, well, he's not an SC guy. And I go, well, what is an SC guy? And he goes, well, if you have to ask, then you don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it revolves around, I think most Aggies kind of understand the big picture of life and school and football. I think there's a certain amount of humility there. There's a certain amount of standard that uh, we aspire to. I think there's a certain amount of connectedness mm -hmm. Um, I think most of the kids on our team are phenomenal that way, mm -hmm. how they love each other, how they connect with each other, mm -hmm. um, how they care about each other, how they get that it's not yeah. about them. Yeah. And Aggie pride's not about winning. It isn't. Coach Foster makes that point all the time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about how you conduct yourself. It's about your aspirations. It's about a person that's able to be selfless and look at the world at large. Um, it's hard to put it all down in a nutshell, yeah. but I think it's a lot of those things. Yeah, And we get that, and I'm after those kind of guys. I want to recruit those kind of guys. I want that to be our culture, uh, which we have here, and we just have a bunch of selfless uh, players. Yeah. And they help each other. They love each other. They get it. They know it's all, all about them. Sometimes they got to move to the defensive side or switch position or maybe not play as much or not catch as many balls, but they sort of get it's not always about me. Yeah. Um, it's about the bigger picture. Uh, and I love that about this school. I love that about this program. That's kind of who I am. And it's great to be at a place where we have that. But I, I guess that's to me is Aggie pride is taking pride in that. And mm -hmm. there's a subtleness to it, really. Mm -hmm. It's not a braggadocious throw it out there. It's just a subtleness of you meet most Aggies, they're probably going to talk more about you than they are yeah. them. That's yeah. just kind of how they are. Hmm. That's really cool. Um, and along those lines, when we were at a AFC, I was telling you beforehand uh, that I, I saw Coach Brady, who's yeah. the outside linebackers coach on staff, and I was just kind of picking his brain because I'm intrigued always with the culture here and just asked him, like, what's it like to be a coach on staff? Like, how do you, how do you like, balance that? And something that you talk a lot about is this idea of, like, the quality balance of life. And our, our company is having, like, our kickoff meetings this year. I know you're meeting with players, talking about last year and looking forward to 2019. And one of the things I'm talking about uh, and di directly referencing you is is the quality balance of life and, like, how to have work-life balance, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and Coach Brady talked a lot about that. What is – I know you talk about it with your team a lot. 
what is, how does this like play out in your life personally? And, and how have you like navigated through that? I mean, obviously a lot of time spent watching film and coaching and family and I know your son's on staff. How do you navigate all that? Well, I'll tell you one story. When I was coaching here, we were in the playoffs. I was coaching defense with Coach Foster. We're right in the middle of it, trying to get something solved. Ironic, I think it was against North Dakota State that week. Really grinding, trying to figure out what do we play against this certain play. And I mean, I can't remember what time it was, but Coach got up. He started putting all his video and his or his tapes in his um, not tapes. It was film in his bag <laughs> and the old projector. Yeah. And he said, "Well." Uh, I'm going to go home and have dinner with my family. And he put his projector on the back and put his backpack on. And I remember him riding out across Howard Field. And I remember thinking to myself, holy cow, like, in my mind at that point, there's nothing more important than beating North Dakota State. But here's a guy that goes, hey, I'm going to go home, hmm. have dinner with my family, and then I'll watch some film. Yeah. And so we all know, all scientific research says, if you get less than eight hours of sleep, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. Um, but it's really, you know, why, why do we do what we do and what is our purpose in life? And, yeah, we're here to positively affect the student athletes and to win games and, and all that, but that doesn't happen unless we keep our saw sharp itself. Mm -hmm. So I try to encourage guys to get out of the office. We all know everybody's into YOLO these days, YOLO. You, know, you only <laughs> live once. And I get that. And yeah. that's cool to some degree. Yeah. Um, but if you have kids and you have a mortgage, you know, you can't always YOLO. you got to mm -hmm. make a living. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you figure out how much do I work? We all know we need to exercise. We all know mm -hmm. that we need to get some sleep. Mm -hmm. We know it can't all just be all work. My dad taught me that when I was little. All work and no play makes John a dull boy. Yeah. And But my dad was a grinder. Now, my dad was a logger, and my dad during the summer seasons would work six and a half days a week. Yeah. So you, it's learning to do both, mm -hmm. of learning to go hard. How do you carve time out? I want our guys to have their families around. I want them to eat with their families. I want them to um, explore some of these other interests. And, and again, I think that's part of the Davis. We're getting our guys out of here in the spring and have them go study abroad. Yeah, I love that idea. we got idea. this Evo program where we're taking guys on internships and getting them to – that, to me, is what the sweet spot is. Now, we all know we have a hard time with that. Yeah. You know, like I said, too much YOLO, and, uh, yeah, you know, you're not going to be eaten. Yeah, uh, you got to survive. <laughs> it, but at the same time, some people just grind themselves, and yeah. sometimes you need to understand less is more. Yeah. So there are certain times we have to work a lot and work hard, but how do we balance that? And we got to the holiday portion here. I just told our staff, I mean, just just go. Yeah. And I'm all, I don't want to bother you, and I don't want to bug you. Go spend time with your family. Read a good book. Watch hmm. some good movies, man. Have some good reflection time. Get your soul back. Yeah. It was a long season. Yeah. So I think I have to emulate that myself. I'm not doing a good job working out. I'm a little too chunky right now. <laughs> and I got I got Aren't more excuses all? than Aren't a high all? school counselor right now. But uh, so anyhow, that's what I try to do. And I try yeah. to keep providing examples for our team and our guys to understand this is in my mind, it is the sweet spot. And it's not just my mind, it's what research would tell you. Yeah. So it's not just something I made sure. up. Um, but I, I think working 120 hours a week and not eating right and not exercising and not seeing your family and not reading a book or putting your kids to sleep, that's not what we're supposed yep. to be doing. Yep. Yeah, I, I saw something recently, Elon Musk, yeah. the Tesla guy, and it was some like statistic about how much he worked. And it was kind of like one of those stats that was applauding like the hard work and – and yet, like, there's all sorts of reports, like, this guy falls asleep at work all the time. And, and like, it, it's it's just hard to to maintain that, like, level of productivity. Um, well, but if you're raising yeah. kids, they, they need you. Yeah. And people always talk about, well, I don't spend qu quantity time. What I spend is quality. Well, my wife actually showed this to me one time. Your kids, they're kind of like clams. They sit there and they're closed. And then at some unspecified time, they open up and show you the pearl. And if you're a parent and you're not there when that opens hmm. up, so it's not just about, oh, quality time. Well, you got to, yeah. you got to, and we all know we're in the kid business. I see it. I see the interactions and I see the, the quality parenting and what that does and how that helps, you know, uh, helps a young person matriculate through life yeah. in a successful and balanced way. And so I, I just, yeah. I, that's just not my philosophy. That might be his, works for him. That's great. Not mine. Yeah. 
So kind of, again, about that quality balance of life, DeAndre, even this past weekend, I think about it, was at in yeah. Austin yeah. at this really cool event uh, on diversity and, and different like opportunities for athletics and academics to merge. But uh, he, when he, when he first started here, you know, again, I'm picking his brain, trying to get information. What's, what's it like, you know? And he like talked about this belief and I even like saw it in him and like on his face, like this, this self-confidence, like a true confidence, not like a, like you're saying, not a braggadocious fake authenticity. It was like, he was becoming a more confident person. And I was like, where, you know, where is that coming from? And he's like, well, there's like a belief amongst the team like there's a true belief that like we can do this, like we're going to to do the best we can and, and be successful. And and again, like what you're saying, not a focus on results. And he attributed that back to like it's from our coaches, like they instill this confidence in us. How do you do that as a coach? A lot of coaches are, are probably listening and like really perking up because they want to know, like, how do I instill true confidence in a team? Yeah, well, I think you. I think you have to have a formula there. You do. Um, I'm not saying mine is tried and true, but I've been at this for over 30 years. I've had tremendous success. I've failed too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big reader. I'm a big advocate. I'm a big learner. So we have. I hate the term smart because it's there's. There are some people that are genetically smarter. Mm -hmm. Our our kids, I think, are are aware and they pay attention. All right, hmm. and that that's a big thing. But you can't just blow smoke on them. They 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 know. So we're trying to provide them factual evidence, analytical evidence, data that supports this reasoning and why this happens and why are we doing things, hmm. and this is what it leads to. And so I always talk about it's like cooking spaghetti. You just keep throwing against the wall till something sticks. And so we're trying to give them tried and true concrete evidence and, uh, so that they can kind of hang on mm -hmm. to that. And then we do really focus on the process and not the product. And this was Soaker's deal and Plow's great about disconnect from the result of uh, hmm. our deal really is trying to get our guys to be the best version of themselves. It, it's not about winning. Hmm. And I always say, quit trying to win and just be a winner. And people go, oh, that's like, well, what does that mean? Well, you study winners and you study losers. What do losers do? What do winners do? And that doesn't always mean score more points, but what do champions do? What do successful parents and people and businessmen, what do they do? And, and when you lose or you get in trouble or you fail, like what led to that? What happened there? And so we're trying always to get ourselves, and I believe my daughter told me this, is, you know, the definition of a family is a group that gets you to be the best version of yourself. Hmm. And we're trying to do that in a real well-rounded way that they know that we do love them and we do care about them and we care about their successes on and off the field deeply and that we're not just doing this because we want to score more points than yeah. another team yeah we're trying to do this i always talk about transformation and you know i want them to get out of the box and be uncommon and see life in a different way and I know what that's like, and I'm into that. Mm -hmm. And I want these guys. The world is fraught with a lot of bad things. We know that. But there's also a lot of beautiful things. And how do we get our guys to gravitate towards that and see that and understand that and get away from the minutia in many cases that draws us from being the, our best version of ourselves? And I think our staff and myself, we're so very passionate about that that when we do speak, it's extremely authentic. It's not something made up. It's not a canned speech. Mm. It's not a bunch of PowerPoint slides. In many cases, it's straight from the heart. Mm. And I think once, you know, once they kind of figure that out, they start going, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Now, I always say some guys, and I say this, everybody's got a button, and I'm trying to find that button. <laughs> and sometimes I'm not good enough to find the button. Sometimes they hide it. Sometimes they disguise it, yeah. but it's always a search to find the button. And when you push the button, everybody can really create this magical thing in their life. But sometimes life has boxed us around. I always talk about getting out of the box. You, just, you know, you're this or you're that, or you're supposed to do that, or you can't do that, or that's not available to you. That's garbage. Yeah. You know, we have to break the box and get outside the box and see what's possible. And so we spend a lot of time. You know, people go, man, isn't it amazing? In two years, you won the championship. You went to the playoffs, blah, blah, blah. Did you think you'd do it this fast? Well, in some cases, maybe it was slow. Why didn't it happen last year, right? <laughs> but, but we have this lid on us. Well, yeah. we can't. That's too fast. Yeah. Well, why is it too fast? But you know what? It might have been slower. <laughs> I, I, you know, but, 
We're not worried about that. It's yeah. not them. It's us. Hmm. It's the race about making ourselves the best version of ourselves. And like I said, I think our kids see the passion. Kevin Blue, our athletic director, we got this Evo program going on. I think everybody's so much on the same page yeah. about the product that we're trying to uh, deliver here. And it's just, it's unbelievable. It's really spectacular. And you see a guy like DeAndre come from this and kind of realize like, oh my gosh, yeah, like this is really, that's just a cool thing. Yeah. It, and, and being like, again, seeing his, his transformation, like to use your word, it, it's a real thing that I think is playing out and actionable steps, like going to Austin and, and being a part of the program and growing as a guy and growing as a player has been pretty awesome to see. So we have to talk about the 2018 season just briefly. I know you're already probably focused on 2019 <laughs> like most coaches history are. Lesson, history lesson. I know, but uh, I, I talked to you about this beforehand too. So I'm going to walk through just real briefly, like each game that mm -hmm. I had a chance to see in person because yeah. it was just a, a really, like you say, magical season. Um, and, and I know that you've used gold standard as like the, the term. And I think it's, it's, the 100th season just happened in UC Davis football history, and it, it arguably was the best. Um, so week one, San Jose State, FBS team, uh, walked in maybe 60 seconds into the game, and it was 7 nothing, and we were just you know flying down the field, and I realized very quickly Coach Plow was going to make us go fast, and uh, the <laughs> offense was humming. But that was a big win, and uh, – just really well you could see the improvements on the defensive side of the ball and creating havoc. Uh, Stanford game, being at Stanford, uh, I ran into my D line coach. I don't know if you know Jason Fisk. Oh yeah, he was my yeah. D line yeah. coach when I was yeah. here. Stanford and, guy. Yeah, and we were we were on the fifty yard line, second half, like tough physical game that we competed really well in. And he's just standing there at the 50 yard. I'm like, Coach Fisk. And his son is a tight end, which yep, yep. if you're a Stanford tight end, then yep. you're you're legit. Uh, Idaho at home, another personal connection. My wife's family has an Idaho cousin who played football there. Nice. So they flew in, came to the game, and I got bragging rights after that one because that we, we put the beat down on them. Uh, homecoming win, 30th birthday party for myself, tailgated, overtime win, just super memorable game, awesome game. Uh, and then on the road at Montana, down 21-3 at half. My wife and I were in the front row with her grandpa, who's a Montana State guy, and he was loving our second <laughs> half. He, he ate up the second half for those 44-21 uh, finals. So we went off in the second half, and we might have scored more than that. I might have that wrong. Northern Arizona at home, another solid win. The Sac State game in Reno, just a classic on the road. Uh, after the, the tough situation with the fires and all the fans traveling, and we had a great time there. And then lastly, the, the home, first ever FCS playoff game at home, Northern Iowa, traditional FCS power, big win there. So when you reflect on the season, you hear some of the tidbits there. And like I said, maybe the best season in school history. Um, what, what do you remember and like what stands out? Yeah, I mean, you you hit a lot of good games. There were a lot of good ones. I mean, you, like you look at the Sac State game. What I'm going to remember about that game is how we had to move the game, and the entire university and everybody involved jumped in and said, "Yeah, let's do it. We got we got to go." Nobody complained. Nobody batted an eye. Kevin Blue was awesome. Our equipment people, everybody. I mean, it's a monumental thing to move a game not that far away from the kickoff. And Nevada helped us out a ton too. So obviously, it was a good win, and you know we captured. The share of the championship and all that and you know the causeway i don't know what you call it now when it's up in reno i guess it's not the causeway <laughs> classic but uh it, that really was it as, as i just thought about how awesome it was how everybody just jumped in including our players and coaches yeah. nobody complained they just said this and again that's aggie pride like mm -hmm. let's just do this mm -hmm. why do we need to mess around you know the montana game obviously spectacular great environment loud as heck we had trouble with the snap count early on <laughs> But again, we always talk to our guys about poise under pressure. I didn't have a lot of poise in that game. I, I, <laughs> but I was not a good example to some degree. But again, we just talk about, let's just go out and operate. Everybody goes, what were the things? What did you say to them? First of all, I just apologized for me because I got mm. a penalty on me. And I just said, hey, we're good. We just got to relax. We got to calm down here and operate. We, we change a few things like we always do. Coach Plow and Tuck and Creighton always do a good job with that. Um, but it was really just a matter of just staying poised. We made a couple of plays. That we didn't quite make in the first half. You get a little momentum, mm -hmm. things happen. We got a mm -hmm. few turnovers on them. So it's always those, I always tell you, it comes down to three plays a game. And people go, that's corny, that's corny. Well, 
the NFL spent a ton of money on this, and it is, and I've done it myself. And people go, wow, wow. So I always say it's not about being close. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you're disregarding effort and all that. It yeah. just means that you, you got to understand that's what it is. So until you're willing to capture those three plays, yeah. you're, you're, you're going to struggle. So it's not about, oh, we were close. No, yeah. no, you weren't. Yeah. I always say the difference between average and good is about like that. The difference between good and great, I mean, it's huge, hmm. huge. And so we, we preach that and we talk about that. And, again, not trying to get into the – I look at that Idaho State game, which was phenomenal when we came back. But really, truthfully, what I loved in that game, the single play, if I'm going to remember one game from this season, it's when we blocked their extra point. Oh, that's right. A blocked extra point. That's right. That allowed us, right, to go for two. We would have had to go for two twice. We kicked an extra point, and then we went for two. But if we don't block that extra point, now we got to get two yeah. two-point conversions. Yeah. But all I'm saying is those little things that really kind of dictate what happens in a season. And um, it's all those little magical moments to me that I'll think about of how our guys helped each other and and uh, how somebody got hurt and another guy stepped in or another guy had to change positions or he had to go from offense to defense or how he gave a ride to the 5 a.m. therapy session. <laughs> so, you know, I don't really jump into like, oh, the win. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, even like the Cal Poly game, which we ended up winning that game significantly. But I'll, the thing I'll think about is we were down 10 to nothing, yep. seemingly couldn't stop them. Nobody panicked. And we turned the, you know, those things to me are just so cool. Yeah. Because that's really what sports are about. Um, and everybody gets hung up with the score and this or that. That's not really what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, going back to that Sac State game, I remember just the the week of, I think it was like Thursday or Friday is when everything got moved. But I also, I think it was that week where y'all announced this huge, yeah. huge thing for, for UC Davis athletics and football. Um, there's going to be a, a performance training center that's opening connected to UC Davis Health Stadium, which is the new name for Aggie Stadium, where the football program and, and uh, lacrosse team and uh, participate. But this project, I'd imagine... Uh, takes a lot of donors, both big and small. And um, when you when you kind of think about what your role is in terms of that, I remember Northern Arizona week. You you know left me a voicemail. Hey Brock, like you know here like exciting things happening yeah. here. Like just the personal touch to it. Like what is your role uh, as a coach in that process? And like I guess specifically about this project, what does it mean for UC Davis athletics and football specifically? Well, I can't even begin to tell you. Davis has been a great place. You know, back when I played here and probably when you played here, your weight room and your locker room and all that stuff, really, that, that was not a significant thing. And I'm not saying that's everything because it's not. Yeah. But in modern-day athletics, at this level, there is an expectation of facilities. Good players want to come to good programs. Yeah, we have a great town. We've got a great school. We've yeah. got great kids. But you're also going, hey, we want to play good football, too. Yeah. And that means certain expectation and strength and conditioning and nutrition. And there's a certain expectation in the training room and the locker room and your meeting facilities and all of that. Yeah. And so you have to move in that direction. You don't have to have a waterfall in the weight room. <laughs> but you need to have enough space yeah. and enough equipment that you can train and have enough personnel. And so one of the things that attracted me to Davis with Kevin is he got that. He got that. He was at Stanford when we beat them. Yeah. And unfortunately, and he's talked about this, I think Dave, Davis people went, hey, look at us. We're there. We just beat Stanford. Yeah. Well, Stanford goes, oh, my gosh, we just lost to Davis. Yeah. We've got to change this. Yeah. So though they go raise $350 million, and they, they go on a tear, right? Yeah. And Davis kind of goes, well, hey, we're Davis. Eh, hubris hurts everybody. Mm -hmm. And it really excited me that Kevin – had the vision and the wherewithal and the ability, and he has really in a short period of time, he's really raised, you know, $40, $50 million. It won't be a cheap building, but it'll be extremely nice yeah. and attract good student athletes here because, hey, at the end of the day, you have to have players. Yeah. I tell, I mean, I'm all for Aggie pride. I'm all for the <laughs> magic. I'm all for that. Yeah. Well, I was before your time, but I played with Ken O'Brien, first round draft yeah. choice. Sean Rogers ran on the USA track team, went to the 49ers. Alan Fleming with the 49ers. Dan Gazaniga with the Raiders. 
Um, Mike Wise, drafted by the Raiders. Bo Eason, drafted by the Oilers. I mean, I can't tell you how many NFL guys. I mean, we had a great football yeah. team, and we went to the national championship. And it's great to have Dan Hawkins on your team, but Dan Hawkins is not going to win the national championship. Yeah. You want him on your team because yeah. <laughs> he's a great kid, and he's yeah, going to work hard have... and do all that, but you need somebody that can run faster, jump higher. You have to have some yes. of that. Um, and we're doing that. I think every guy that we've signed, by and large, the last few classes, almost every guy has had several Mountain West offers. Yep. Some have had Pac-12 offers, but they want to stay in California. They want to get the UC degree, and they want to play good football. And I think we're proving that we can play good football and that we're going to support good football. The Evo program, all that, I think we're attracting a really marvelous type of student athlete here right now. You know, my role in that is obviously to inspire, but I've also learned this because I've done this a few times. you got to put a little proof behind the pudding. If we're sitting here having this conversation when I first come, that sounds great. It sounds good. Now, all of a sudden, though, see if you do it. there's a little credibility, right? Yeah. Now there's a little like, hey, yeah. we better listen. I could have said the same thing when I first showed up, and I kind of did to some degree, but I've also learned through experience, hey, just shut up and go show what you can yeah. do, right? But then when you show what you can do, then all the supporters got to show what they can do. And obviously, Bruce Edwards has led this thing as well as a bunch of other people yeah. with some really significant gifts. Chancellor May is very supportive. He gets what, he comes from Georgia Tech, he gets what athletics can do for a university. I know when we were on the Stanford game, I had a lot of people, you know, on Twitter kind of going, hey, I didn't know anything about Davis once. I, Man, that's quite a school. Boy, that's an unbelievable, you know, we have people that don't even know where Davis is. Yeah. I mean, are you kidding me? We're the best viticulture. We're the best ag. We're one of the we're, we're the top vet school. We're one of the best schools for having low income and first generation. Like all these amazing programs here, and people go. And you know this. When I got the job here, there were so many guys who go, "Hey, congrats! Are they are they D three? Are they D two? Yeah, man. Like, where are you? Are you guys in Southern California? <laughs> right? And there are people going, "Hey, a Cal Davis. Yeah, you know, go it Mustangs. Kills me. Uh, it, we're not the it Mustangs. It kills me. It kills me. We're not Cal, Cal Davis. Davis. We're UC Davis. Yes. We're located on High 80. We're between the Bay Area and Sacramento. Yeah. Right. We're 35,000 students. Yeah. I mean, so I think just being a front porch yes. for our athletic program is tremendous. But I always say this: you can't. I figured this out too. You can't do it by yourself. You can have all this passion, all this experience, all this knowledge of what to do, but people have to help you. And we have a lot of people jumping in. And everybody's been great that way. So, yeah. um, And that's what leads to, I always talk about a thousand invisible moments. That's what leads to this season. It's not, and I'm not saying this to be overly humble. It's not just me. Mm -hmm. It's not. There's a lot of people helping out. There's a lot of people, whether financially or emotionally or volunteering or in academics or the training room. And if they don't jump in and help, we go nowhere. Yeah. And I remember you saying that at Sac State the very first time I met you. Like, it's because I think, the, you know, that's part of the pressure is like this one person is going to turn around a program. And like you're saying, like, obviously, that's that that just like can't be done. It takes a, a huge amount of people. Yeah. They, 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 in modern day athletics, they think, oh, let's hire the wizard. This guy's got pixie dust. <laughs> well, there's a lot of good football coaches that know how it's supposed to be done. But yeah. if you can't have the wherewithal to get it done, it's not yeah. happening. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited for it. I think all all football guys are just pumped. The the renderings look beautiful yeah. and it's gonna be it's gonna be really exciting. All right, so we're almost done here. I know everyone would love to listen I could listen to Coach <laughs> Hawkins for like five hours straight and just I wish I had a crush better, my Monday. I wish I had a better, more romantic, <laughs> deeper tone of voice that would be like the velvet fog that would really endear oh, not you. Bad. I've got kind of a nasally no, yeah, I don't know. Opie, Opie Taylor kind of a voice. So. Okay, so the either-or game, this is just kind of fun, and this is more Davis-specific stuff. So just either-or, I'm going to throw out two options. Okay. You just tell me which one you rather choose. Okay. okay. So if you're going to hang out on campus. Would you rather hang out in the Arboretum or the Quad? Quad. Quad. Okay. Burgers and – this is now where you're going to eat in town. Okay. Burgers and brew or Zia's Delicatessen? Ooh. That's Well, a you tough might one. get me in trouble here. Uh, ooh. That's tough. They both you help can't us be a political. Lot. You can't say both. They don't help. Ooh. <laughs> I don't. I got to go tie there. I don't know. I don't okay. Go tie. Okay. What do you get at Burgers and Brew? Do you just get like a normal hamburger? You get the bison? Uh, I usually get the avocado. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm a big avocado guy. You're in California. How can you not yeah. love avocado? You're right. So You're right. Go bunless. Get the burger. Okay. And the avocado. There you go. Do you bike around campus or walk around campus? Uh, mostly walk. I hate to say this. I should have a bike. 
like I said, I have more excuses than a high school counselor. But <laughs> You're uh, in Davis and you don't have a bike? I do have a bike. My house is getting renovated. All my stuff is packed and put away. I don't even really know anything is. I need to have a bike that once I get here, I can bike around. And Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, I walked. I don't know. And I always got a lot of crap for it from guys on the team. But I would, I would leave earlier. It's a huge campus. For those who don't know, it's the biggest UC campus. And I would, I would just walk everywhere. But I liked it. It was like a good. I got to be honest with you. When I was here before, I had a moped. One of those guys. Illegal. That, that, so I would drive it. And then as soon as I saw somebody, I'd turn it off and I'd do the pedal thing. <laughs> and they'd all look at me like, I know you're not doing that all the time. <laughs> but I lived out in South Davis and I couldn't bike all the way in. Shh, that's a secret. All right. No one will say anything about okay. that. Uh, favorite place you've ever lived, other than Davis, because it's the best out of all, all your stops. Gosh, man, you're putting it hard on me now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really the I and I say this I'm really one of those blossom where you're planted. I've had guys going, "Hey, is it I had fun coaching at Christian Brothers High School." I, yeah. I I I you know, people go, "Did you like coaching there more than there?" I mean, it's it's all, I don't know. Montreal was an unbelievable city. Obviously, Vienna was an unbelievable city. Boulder's a great place. I don't I Boise's I don't know. I again, that's just hard for me to yeah. I would say this though. Okay, typically in my life I have, again, this goes back to the quality balance of life. I've not wanted to move someplace where I wouldn't want to live yeah. for a long time. And my wife's always been great about that, too. Here she comes. But <laughs> so every place we moved, we wouldn't go there unless we thought, man, okay. this would be a great place to live. Okay. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. Um, I know that your son was one of your players at one point. So, again, we can leave him off the table with this question. Yeah. But what are some players that stand out? Maybe like a favorite player. Oh or two. man! You don't. I know this one's real tough, but we all do have favorites. Let's be honest. Well, again, I I always say it's corny. I don't I don't always look at like the best player. Yeah. You know, sometimes to me they're guys that you never heard of. That we have some of those guys on our team right now. They want they're not superstars, but you know how. Like I'll give you an example. Like Brock Johnson. Good is name. one of our backup, <laughs> one of our backup quarterbacks. I mean, this guy is unbelievable. I really think one of the reasons we had such a successful season is because of him. That's like awesome. he can play, but he's the consummate teammate. Hmm. He's the consummate backup quarterback. He'll hmm. do whatever it takes. You know, Dan Plum, who got our Aggie Pride Award. Dan Plum didn't even play this year. Hmm. I mean, I, I appreciate those guys. You, you need your Jakes and your Keelans and your Masons. I get all that, but to me, I always look at those unsung people that do so much. And that's why, I mean, I've, yeah. I've been blessed. I've had a lot of really super great players in my career, but I always think about those guys that nobody knew about that uh, just busted their tail and did whatever it took. Those guys, to me, are yeah. always my favorites. That's really cool. Uh, and he does have a great first name. That's yeah, a good name. Uh, so last question. This is an exercise that I just went through recently, and I, it's simple, but it was it was powerful for me. So when you – you know, again, like start looking back on, on your career and then also start thinking like just in life, you know, how do you how do you want those, especially close to you and those who you really respect? How do you want to be remembered? Of course, as a coach, because um, I know that's your profession amongst other professions you've had, but then also just as a person, like how do you want to be seen? How do you want to be remembered? Well, my wife, Misty, is here, so I'll be as a good husband, but I, I really... <laughs> I really mean this. Like, I just, I, when I left Davis, the first thing I thought about when I went to Christian Brothers High School was like, how do I do this at Christian Brothers? And I said it was a good feeling. And then you had to figure out what did that, what does that mean? That was the, mm. that was my resonating emotion was it was a good feeling. Okay. And a lot of that came from the coaches and it came from the players that, that were in this program. But I sort of see myself again as a vessel. I want to. I want to. I want to make a positive difference in the lives of others. I'm impacting coaches here and young coaches and their families, and our players and people that are go out in society. And you think about sort of the ripple effect of all the people that I've coached in my career. And I don't know. I actually try to loosely try to figure out how much that, how many people that were. And I don't know. That's probably fifteen hundred or two thousand kids. That's crazy. And you think about if one of those guys touched one person and they touched one person, that ripple effect that goes out. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about that a lot. Before, you're, you're just trying to get there. And I'm yeah. still trying to reinvent myself. But now I'm also to the point where I'm really trying to help 
our young coaches become better fathers and better husbands. And I'm trying to help our, our, cause just a lot of these guys like Deandre, they have the capability to go out in their church, in their school, in their community, in their business and really make a major impact yeah. and be an icon for them. I see that. And I sense that, yeah. that to me is my biggest thing right now. Cool. Um, and that's, that's really what kind of floats my boat and what gets me up in the morning and keeps me up at night and things I think about and, most of the stuff I read, it's not fiction because I want to pass it on to our team. Mm. I love watching documentaries. Normally, when I watch something, other than we we are looking forward to Game of Thrones and and we're Vikings. How can fans. you not? Yeah, <laughs> but you know, you're trying to use something, you're trying to get something that you can give to them in a meaningful way, right? And I think when you do that, and it's I always tell them, I didn't make this stuff up, mm. right? But that's that's really what it's about. And I think when you do that. You know this. That's why we won 20 conference championships in a row. Were those guys good coaches? Yeah. Did we have good players? Yeah. But you know what we had? We had this bigger principle of what's right and what's wrong. How do you treat people? How do you do things right? How do you have a good marriage? You know, how do you impact society? It was all that stuff. Not in an overdo this manner. A lot of it was very subtle. Um, and then that, look at all the Davis coaches that have left here. And I don't know, almost everyone that I know of has enjoyed success, a lot of success. Yeah, yeah the coaching tree is very important. Now, that's, there's a certain amount of tactical stuff that goes in mm -hmm. there, but I think it's the other stuff, yeah. you know, that you get the most out of people. You know how to treat people. You care about people. And I always took so much pride in my career when they'd kind of go, oh, you're a Davis guy. Mm -hmm. Like, they knew. Mm -hmm. They knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, you're a Davis mm -hmm. guy. Yeah. So that's it, man. It's about making a positive difference. And I always say we're leaders and role models, mentoring future leaders and role models. And again, we keep going back to DeAndre because he's your guy, but that's what it is. Like, I got to look at DeAndre not like he is right now. Mm -hmm. I got to look at him in 20 years. Yeah. Like, what can this guy, yeah. I got to start mentoring this guy, what he can be in 20 years. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. There's a, a quote that makes me think of that. Uh, it says, we're all like rough drafts of the people we're becoming. And I think it's a really cool mindset, exactly what you're talking about, like viewing people in terms of potential for yeah. what they could become. And just speaking one last time about Aggie Pride, because I know if, if people haven't got the sense yet, um, there is an enormous amount of pride, not in the, the boastful type of way, but like I said, when I got to talk to Coach Brady and, and then even you know hearing your words here today, there is just so much um, countercultural wisdom at UC Davis. Not that you know other places don't have it; other places definitely do. But it it fills me with a lot of pride, and and it's it's very um, humbling and encouraging to know where the program has been and where it's going. And so, would like to thank you for your time. Really do appreciate it. I know it's a, a busy schedule and hectic time of year, but best of luck in 2019. Thanks, and. We'll talk to you again. All right. Go eggs.